I would like to uh, present you Clarissa. Yes. Clarissa is uh, giving the introduction to Johan, and she's the first uh, uh, student speaker, so that uh, <laughs> takes some courage. So uh, right. I think I'm sure you're doing great. Hi, everyone. My name is Clarissa Acevedo. I'm from Cordoba, Veracruz, Mexico. And this is my fifth year as an undergrad. And I will be presenting um, Johan Yesing, and he's a professor of local and regional planning at the Institute of Urban Planning and Design, the Department of Architecture at the University of Sturgut since 1992. From 1983 to 1991, he was a lecturer at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning in the University of Oldenburg, where he earned his doctorate and his habilitation. He has a diploma in architecture and urban planning from the Technical University of Darmstadt, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing the German words right. <laughs> His research concentrates on social aspects of urban development and on urban planning methods. He has published and edited several books and many scientific articles on metropolitan strategies in Europe, urban, urban, urban regeneration, mixed use development, new scenario techniques in urban planning, and related topics. Current research projects include international cooperative research on processes of reurbanism in the United States and in Europe and on innovation um, processes in urban planning. He is a member of the board of Deutsche Academy, the German National Academy of Spatial Research and editorial board of the Planning Research Journal. Please let's give a warm welcome to Johann Jessen. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I, my name is Johann Jessen. I like to thank Clarissa for introducing me to the audience. I'd like to thank Hayo for inviting me for this conference. I will talk about challenges for reurbanization in Germany. Uh, Clarissa told that this is one of my research subjects. Um, Hayo said. It, might be a good idea to invite me because we are working on a research study. We are just starting to do that about the subject of reurbanization, and we will have two case studies, one in the city I come from, Stuttgart, and the other city is Portland. Uh, well, so, where will I talk about? First, I will some, do some remarks on the research study on reurbanization in the US and in Germany. And then, and this will be the main part of my presentation, I will talk about some urban projects of inner city housing in Germany. As this is a conference on, of architects, and I thought this might be interesting for you. First, some comments to this project. It has an acronym short name, we call it Reurb, and it's about reurbanization in the United States and in Germany. And we compare in this study the driving forces and the spatial patterns of reurbanization in the US and in Germany, and we have also a case study, two case studies to uh, analyze this in depth in Portland and Stuttgart. It's a joint study. We work together with the Research Institute in Dortmund, the Research Institute for Urban and Regional Development. Well, um, the issue of reurbanization is a very important issue. It's in the last year, it has been discussed widely, both in Germany, both in Europe, on one hand and in the US, and there have been lots of publication. What do we mean by reurbanization? We mean the process that the inner city areas gain attractivity again, gain jobs, gain population again, and uh, that, that there is a reversal of attractivity from a long period of loss of population, of decay, back to, to uh, a kind of uh, revival of downtown and the inner city areas. And Portland, of course, is a very 
a specific and very well-known example throughout the US and also all over the world. Um, We will analyze the processes of reurbanization in the US and in Germany on three levels. On the national level, where we compare the metropolitan regions in the US and Germany, all those uh, regions that have more than one million inhabitants. These are 50 million, 50 regions in the US and 14 regions in Germany. The analysis is based on the census data from 1980 to 2010. And then we will work on the regional level. We pick out five regions in the US and five regions in Stuttgart that have very specific patterns of reurbanization. And then we will turn to the local case studies where we compare region, the region and city of Portland <coughs> and the region and city of Germany. What is the focus of this research? First, we try to identify the structural changes in metropolitan regions, the population dynamics in these regions. Is this true? Is this hypothesis true that the inner city areas gain power again Gain, uh, gain population, jobs, and so on. Then we try to identify the driving forces and the social impacts of reurbanization. And the overall questions, there are two overall questions. One is, is there a converging? Are these converging processes or are these processes diverging in Europe on one hand and in the US at the other hand. And the second question is, what does urban planning, urban strategy, urban politics do to the process of reurbanization? Does it support it, or uh, is it mostly a market-driven process? I will not go into detail of this study. It has four modules. Uh, two more overall uh, analysis, analysis sorry, uh, on the interregional and intraregional level, and then we go down to the investigations of the case studies where we go down to the neighborhoods and uh, the local areas. Why Stuttgart and why Potsdam? <laughs> why, why Stuttgart? Why Portland? <laughs> uh, they are pretty similar, these cities. They are similar in size, both the city and the region with 600,000 inhabitants and regions with more than two and a half million inhabitants. <coughs> they are also similar in the topography, as you see from the picture. Uh, it's pretty hilly. It's a mountainous area, though we have no uh, air rail, what is it called? This <laughs> air tram. We have no air trams, but similar things. Um, Stuttgart is the capital of the state of Baden-Württemberg. I know that Portland is not the capital of the state of Oregon, but it's the biggest city of Oregon. They have both a strong, uh, both are the economic engine of their respective states. They have a strong industrial base and export based clusters. They are the headquarters of important industrial companies Intel in Portland, Nike in Portland, Mercedes Benz, and Porsche, very much the automotive industry in Stuttgart. And both have a very strong legal and political base of regional planning, as they have a selected, uh, elected regional parliament, both of them, and they are unique 
in their states, and um, they have uh, a very well uh, strong reputation in their uh, nation because of this uh, uh, the, the, this quality. Um, but there should there are differences, of course, and they should not be denied. The biggest differences between Portland and Stuttgart is that nobody would say that Stuttgart is the people where young people go to retire. Uh, we have those cities too, but Stuttgart is not one of them. So it's not a very, it's not a town where young people really like to go. They get, like to go to Freiburg or they like to go to Berlin. Well, I only one or two slides to the first results of our study. We started with this research only a few months ago. I, I would be happy to present the, the comparison between Stuttgart and Portland in two years time when we have finished our studies, but I give you one uh, idea which shows that the issue of reurbanization is very important in Germany and um, here you see a, a graph showing the population change in urban and suburban regions in metropolitan regions in Germany and in, in the US. In Germany, 14 German metro and 50 US metros. And they show that, well, how is uh, urban area and suburban area defined in, in our study? Urban area is the core city of a region, and the suburban area is the whole region without the core city. So it's a very, very simple model. And it shows that since five or six years in Germany, the population in the core cities, the growth of the population in the core cities exceeds the population development in the, in the suburban areas, which is completely new to our country. In the US, the process of suburbanization is still going strong, we know that, but when you look into detail, uh, into the, in detail into the data, you see that there are many big cities also in the US where the, there's a population growth also in the core cities. So the process of reurbanization, of uh, gaining of population and jobs in the inner city also takes place in the US, but it's not, it's, uh, it's a parallel process of reurbanization and suburbanization. So if you see the figures in the, in the last line uh, in, in, the, in, in the 2000s, the population in the urban areas in Germany grew by 3% and the suburban areas by 0.6%. Uh, uh, in the US, the growth of population in the metropot metropolitan areas was 4.7%, much higher than in Germany, but the suburban growth was even uh, three times this size. So um, this also shows that the population growth in urban areas in the US is much stronger than it is in Germany. Here, last graph showing these developments in Germany between 1999 and 2008. Uh, the population change, uh, it shows that the population grows in the central cities and g is going down in the suburbs. And at the same time, when you see at the, the jobs, you have uh, the same development uh, <laughs> growing numbers in the central cities and uh, declining numbers in the suburbs. Well, th this is just the background of what, is, what comes next, what is the main part of my presentation. It's about the urban projects of inner city housing in Germany. When you see that the 
reorganization in Germany is, uh, is very strong. That means that also architectural, urban planning, urban design is concentrating in the inner city areas, in the inner parts of the metropolitan areas in Germany. First, I want to tell you something about the major trends in housing in Germany. Then I will point out some new architectural characteristics of those inner city housing projects in Germany. If you may say so, the architectural language of reurbanization. And then in the last part, I will present two examples of major urban projects in <coughs> Germany. First, the major trends. There are five trends. First of one, first is the polarization between prospering urban regions in Western Germany and sta stagnating and shrinking regions in Eastern Germany. Just to show you a map, this is Germany and you see the, all those blue dots on the right side. This is Eastern Germany and these are all shrinking cities. Cities that lose population, that lose jobs, that have an aging population, they have an eroding regional housing market, decreasing land prices and high vac vacancy rates. And also, of course, a, re uh, a decreasing tax basis. And the red marks, mostly in the West, but not only. We have all those growing cities. Stuttgart is definitely one of them. Continuing in migration, a tight regional housing market, rising land prices, and so on, just the opposite. But when you look in detail, you see also lots of shrinking cities in Western Germany concentrated in rural areas and in old industrial regions like the Ruhr area or the Saar area. <coughs> the second major trend is the transformation from a highly regulated to a more deregulated housing market. That means that uh, the public subsidies for affordable housing has reduced almost down to zero. It means that tax incentives for homeowner owners have been abolished and um, that, well, that very important that international stakeholders, international uh, developers have uh, entered the housing market in Germany and bought hundreds and thousands of housing units in, and not, are now a very important player on the housing market in Germany. Then the third trend is that the uh, growing share of building investments in the housing sector goes into maintaining, refurbishing, and modernizing the existing housing stock. Uh, in, in figures, in 2000, 45% of all the housing investment went into the existing building stock. And in 2011, it was about 75%. And this modernization concentrates on the uh, on saving energy in the buildings, on isolating the buildings, and renewing the heating systems. And the fourth characteristic is the demographic and social change resulting in a growing variety of types of household, a process that we can uh, observe all over the country and also, of course, in the US. Uh, less family with kids, uh, a growing number of single households, um, uh, a growing number in Germany, a growing number of elderly people living alone. And, we, and the fifth characteristic, which, which is very important for the, these uh, urban renaissance and this process of reurbanization, is that there is an increasing demand for inner city housing since the turn of the century, I would say. Central areas, downtown areas, inner city housing areas of larger cities are 
again gaining inhabitants. And which is uh, very important, it's not, these are not the poor people, but also the rich people, the educated people who discover the inner city as a nice place to live. Why is there a new uh, demand for housing in the inner city? Well, in Germany, the reasons are a growing number of single households, students, job starters. But very important, many family starters want to live with their kids in the inner city and not in the suburb. The, reason, the background is that most of these young families, both of the parents are uh, uh, lead a professional life and it's easier for them to lead a professional life when living in the inner city. And on the other hand, there's also uh, growing um, numbers of new housing built in the inner city uh, due to urban regeneration processes. I will come to that. The process of reurbanization, the building of new housing, housing in urban neighborhoods was hailed when it occurred, let's say, eight or ten years ago in Germany. And I think it was the same here in Portland when the uh, Pearl District was developed. Um, because, uh, well, it brought life into the inner city. There were new parks, new housing, and, and there, they, it brought a new quality of life into the inner city areas. And for the first time, I would say, architects and urban planners saw that market processes went along the same direction than their own ideas. So uh, this is, was pretty new, at, at least at first glance. But uh, years later, in the last years, the, the, let's say the dark side of reurbanization became more obvious not only in the US but also in Germany because uh, the process of reurbanization also uh, caused uh, social problems. The key word is gentrification, the displacement of people, of poorer people uh, who could not afford any longer the rents they had to pay in their areas. And I know that this was, is a major issue here in Portland too. Uh, and uh, the census data from 2010 showed that there has been a tremendous numbers of poor people, ethnic minorities that has been expelled from the inner city areas to the suburban fringe. We have the same discussion at least in the uh, large metropolitan areas in Germany too, especially in Berlin. You see this yellow arrow. Uh, this shows the na urban neighborhoods, who, the, the migration of urban migration. migration. So it started, started here in Kreuzberg, going over to Prenzlauer Berg and to Friedrichshain, and now it's back in the west in uh, Neukölln. Um, five, six years ago, uh, architect an architectural student in Germany might not know what gentrification is. Now it's almost a word that you can read in the newspaper, as you see from the writing on the wall in Berlin. Keine Angst, es ist nur gentrification. Uh, it means, have no fear, it's only gentrification. Well, that's about the major trends in housing in Germany. Now I would come to some architectural characteristics of inner city housing projects in Germany. Uh, the, as I told you, the architectural language of reurbanization. 
First of all, new urban housing in the inner city area is nothing new in Germany. There have been inner city urban projects since the early 80s. Um, the idea of uh, bringing back the old European urban form, high density, block structure, corridor streets, squares and parks, and mixed use was brought into the in brought into praxis, I would say, for the very first time in Germany in the International Building Exhibition in Berlin around 1980. A famous project is the project Ritterstraße by the Luxembourgian architect Rob Krier. But since then, things have changed. <coughs> One point, there's a bigger variety in urban form and in housing topology. We observe a growing variety of types of urban housing that are targeted to different types of private households. I will introduce these four old but also new types in this context uh, of housing typology. The first are the lofts and studios in converted old industrial buildings. That's the classic. That's the classic also in the Pearl Street. That's the classic in any other country. This is one example, the lofts in a former cotton mill in Leipzig. Uh, it's a wonderful example, but I should add that we are run out of those old factories. There are no old factories anymore that can be converted, at least in Germany. Maybe it's almost the same in, in Portland. So this will not be the future of inner city housing because uh, maybe it's more important now to, to modernize those old factories that have been converted, let's say, 20 years or 30 years ago. We have the renaissance, uh, the renaissance of high-rise apartment buildings in Germany. Whereas I should say that renaissance is a wrong word because it was never popular for well-to-do people, for rich people to live in a uh, high-rise building. Unlike in other cities in the US, like in New York, Manhattan, or in Chicago, or unlike the mega cities in Southeast Asia and South America. In Germany, uh, <coughs> luxury apartments and high-rise is a pretty new phenomenon. Here are two uh, well-known examples, the so-called Steitle Tower, called after the architect Steitle in Munich, Theresienhöhe, and rather new, the Marco Polo Tower as part of the Hamburg Hafen City architects are Danish and partner. Another high-rise building, the first high-rise building in Frankfurt, which is the, America, the most American city in Germany with all those office high-rise buildings as office buildings. This was the first uh, residential high-rise building in Frankfurt by, Frankfurt by the British architect Richard Rogers. The second new type of housing we find in the inner city housing projects in Germany are so-called townhouses. They are called in this English word in Germany, townhouses in Berlin, and they are advertised like that. Single family houses for well-to-do young families in the inner city. The most famous example, because it was the first of it, of these projects are the Berlin townhouses am Friedrichswerder in Berlin. You see on the map on the left-hand side, that's 10 minutes walk to the very center of Berlin. Another very typical example is our townhouses in shrinking cities. This is a project in Leipzig. It's almost 10 years old. It was built in a time when Leipzig was, uh, was facing a period of shrinkage, shrinkage. 
And what we, have they done here? They tore down those tenement blocks you see in the background and then built, reduced the building density, replaced the densely built apartment block structures or, uh, at, on this site and built these new townhouses for young families and this project was a big success. Now that Leipzig is growing again, a project like that wouldn't be realized for a, for a second time. And the fourth new type of uh, architectural concept is the converting of, how, of, of offices into housing. I don't know if there are any examples for that in Portland. I guess so. Are there? One. One. Not many. Well, it's not many in Germany too, but there are more than one. Lots of them, I would say. I like, I like to show this example. This has been a research institute. You see on the black and white photo uh, on the left side, and now they converted it into luxury apartments. Architect is Wilford und Schupp, that is a follow-up studio from uh, Sterling, in, from the British architect Sterling. And this is another example. This is a headquarter of the Federal Association of German Industry, this, the BDE, the headquarter that was built, a typical building that was uh, constructed in the early 70s. Now it is converted into luxury, into a residential complex with 250 apartments. This is, project is now underway. But uh, in, we've learned this from other countries. Uh, this is a project uh, that you may know. This is the Rotunda. That was a, the most important, high, important and well-known high-rise, an icon in a way, in the city of Birmingham, the, biggest, the second biggest, largest city in the uh, United Kingdom. And it was converted from an office tower into an apartment tower situated in the very center of the city. These were the new urban forms of inner city housing in Germany. Then there are changes, new ca architectural characteristics in the urban context. And we, we can see divergent trends. Uh, one trend is that you find these projects Often, uh, often in a rough neighborhood. They, they form a rough mix of uses. And secondly, another issue, a little bit uh, in opposite to this rough mix, is the tendency to, to uh, stress safety questions and cocooning. First, to the rough mix best example for me is the project Frankfurt Westhafen. This is an urban regeneration of an old inner city harbor district in Frankfurt. It was converted to a high quality housing with so-called urban villas, very expensive housing on, on the waterfront side with every apartment having a little marina to itself and well these are not the only uh, kind of high housing on that area there's also affordable housing so it's not a, a one-sided project I would say but what uh, amaz really amazes me it's that in the very close vicinity to a powerhouse a coal-fired powerhouse that you if someone of you, maybe someone of you was in Frankfurt when you drive in with the train, you pass this powerhouse, which is gigantic. You see this on the left hand side. Uh, I still wonder how people who can afford every kind of house can accept the close vicinity, the, uh, the, the proximity of the projects like that. 
And I should add that this project is only a 10 minutes walk from the railway main station, main railway station from Frankfurt, and the neighborhood around the Frankfurt main station is the red light district of of red light district of uh, of Frankfurt. So this, but this, uh, all these apartments were sold in in only a few months. So they had no problem problem with marketing them. Well, uh, this attractivity of rough, rough mix of uses for inner city housing um, has some equivalence in our countries, in uh, neighboring countries, especially in the Switzerland. A very famous example is the project of housing for the elderly integrated in a new soccer stadium, which was designed by the Swiss architects Herzog Dumoulin. And also these housing for elderly very close to a football stadium or a soccer stadium is one of those examples of a very rough mix of, uh, of inner city housing. Another example, also in Switzerland, in Zürich West, this is a larger urban regeneration of a former industrial district. And there we also find, surprisingly, family housing in the center of the area, as you see on the left hand side. And also these uh, family houses were rented and bought. And I, it really amazes me. And I'm not sure that this will be sustainable and that this will be last that this will last, but this is, uh, we have to see that there is, uh, people are ready to accept these rough neighborhoods, and at least some of these people accept that or see it as a, see it as a selling point in a way. And then we have the other tendency of creating isolated islands of harmony and uh, protection in, in the same city. Uh, one example are the Prenzlauer Gärten, Prenzlauer Gardens. This is a development of, by, by a private uh, housing project by a private developer with about 50 or 60 townhouses. It says Berlin's first townhouse quarter following the English model. That goes back to what I said before, townhouse as a very attractive brand for inner city housing. And when you uh, have a close look on the photograph uh, in the middle, this, you see uh, a gatehouse and there's a doorman. It's a private street, though it's open to the public, you can go there. It's not a gated community in the in a very narrow sense, but it comes pretty close to it. Everybody can go there, but uh, you, you refrain from going there when you pass by. Um, another example for cocooning and isolating uh, from the surroundings is the model of the, the concept of car loft. Um, Karloff is a unique building also in Berlin. Maybe you have heard about that. It's an apartment building where you not only go up to, the, to your apartment alone, then you can, but you also can use the, the uh, your, drive your car into the, uh, what is the lift? Is it lift? Elevator. Elevator. Oh, I'm looking for that word. Elevator. You can drive with your car into the, not yourself, you, you don't go not only yourself into the elevator, but also your car. So it's, uh, it, it's protected. Mm -hmm. This is the first new housing form in Europe or in Germany where there is a pat patent on that concept. <laughs> well, maybe the, the, the architect, the architect is a German architect, Manfred Dick, maybe he is successful with that model. This, there's a prototype in Berlin, Kreuzberg, which is a rough region too. 
and there are other projects like that planned in Berlin and other places in Germany. So these are the two main char characteristics of single projects of inner city housing. And, and now I come to my last uh, point. Uh, I come to major urban projects, major urban regeneration schemes, which uh, contribute very much to the process of the urbanization. I will show two examples. One example in Hamburg, this is a Hamburg Hafen City project, and then a much smaller one in Tübingen, close to Stuttgart, the French Quarter. Both are uh, conversion projects. In Hafen City, it's the conversion of an old harbor area. In Tübingen, it's the conversion of an old military area. It was the place for the, it was the barracks of the French military that left the country in 1992. That's why it's called French Quarter. This is a Hamburg Hafen City project. It's 155 hectares former harbor area. On the picture below, you see what, a, what it looked like let's say 15 years ago, warehouses, railway tracks, um, brown lands, nothing happened there anymore. The harbor, harbor has immigrated to the outskirts of Hamburg up uh, the Elbe River to close, closer to the North Sea. 60,000 new dwellings for 12,000 people are planned. 35,000 jobs in the service, service sector are planned, and it's uh, 2 million squ square meters of floor space that has to be, that is, uh, that is planned there. And it's a huge amount of public investment, 2.5 billion euro. It's the biggest waterfront project in Europe right now, and they are now halfway on the, uh, uh, top in the, on the uh, image nah, image no. below you see uh, the, the, the parameter of this project and ha they are now halfway and they, they are about to finish this project let's say in 10 years time so it's a long durée thing This is a master plan to the project. You see um, it's very much uh, dominated by those uh, canals and those harbor uh, facilities. And they really promoted the concept of the European urban block and the corridor streets and the promenades along the quays. That's the first phase of the project. The so-called Daiman Kai is it's a mixture of office buildings and luxury apartment buildings, I should say, and is pretty much dominated by the by the brick material because this red brick is a uh, I should say the traditional uh, material in the city of Hamburg. It was the, the high public investment mainly goes back to the fact that two, two facts. First, they, they built a new underground line into the Hafen city, which was widely discussed and criticized because it was very, very as uh, expensive as you may uh, uh, think of get because you have to go under the Elbe River. And People argued that, well, all those money that was spent there in this two or three kilometers of a new underground line are needed, were needed bitterly in the suburban fringe of the city. So 
reurbanization often goes along with the concentration of resources of uh, uh, money, of resources, and of passion and ambition of the planners. So it also goes along often with ne uh, neglecting the outer parts of the city. Uh, high quality public space is one of the main features of these new inner city projects. Um, so the, there are three or four new parks and promenades that were, were uh, the design was found in uh, public design competitions and this is won by a Spanish uh, architect it should bring a little Mediterranean flair to Hamburg, and the uh, image shows this Mediterranean flair, but the weather in Hamburg not always fits to that flair. There was a lot of critics after four or five years of implementing the program. One major critic was that it was only a very, that it was a very lopsided, one-sided form of urban housing for single people, for urbanites, for, for those young, not young, single persons, highly qualified with a lot of money, and that there was no room for young families. And when you build a, 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 prod, a, build a new neighborhood with 6,000 neighborhoods, uh, 6,000 housing units, meaning 12,000 people. It's not, you cannot think of, an, of a neighborhood uh, only out of urbanites, 12,000 single persons. So they, they changed the program and built family housing. This is an example for that. And this means you have another kind of urban park where children can play. This is also a new, very new park in the Hafen city and it's, this is very important. You need schools and childcare. This is a new school in the very middle of this very dense urban area of the Hafen city, the Katharinenschule, a new school. It's so dense that you have the schoolyard on top of the building you see this on the right, on the picture on the right hand side. But the, the school, you see it on the picture below on the left hand side is very close to this green park so there, is a, there are lots of places where the kids could go. But keeping uh, land free for urban infrastructure is a very important issue when you create when you create a new neighborhood like that that uh, planners should think of that uh, from the beginning and then there are those big projects those uh, you may have heard of that that is a concert hall uh, designed by Herzog Dumeron this is uh, Hamburg hopes that this will be to Hamburg what the Opera House in Sydney is to, the Opera House is from, from by John Utsam is to Sydney. Oh, and today it's mostly a financial scandal because originally it was planned to be built with 60 million euro. Now the last figures are 600 million euros, so ten, t 10 times the number, and that's what they are talking about, not about the building. And it's they built since 10 years, and it will be opened in two years. So maybe it's a really wonderful building, and it will have the same career than the Opera House in Sydney, but who knows. And it's not only a concert hall, it's in, it's in converted old warehouse in the warehouse part, the basement, there are the car parks, and there are also studios and a few housing units and a four-star hotel, or five-star, I guess. 
and it's also the site, Hamburg's the Hafen city area is also the site for the new building of the HCU, HCU Hafen City University. This is the academy for architects and planners and artists in Hamburg. It's under construction and my colleagues will in, move into this building, I think, in one or two months. Now I come to my last project. This is the Tübingen French Quarter. Tübingen is a small town, 75,000 inhabitants. It's a romantic university town with an old medieval core that you see up. Oh. See, this is a medieval core. This is a Neckar River. And this is the area of the French Quarter originally two separate uh, barracks. This is a Loretto barracks and this are, these are the Hindenburg barracks and they were uh, knit together in, in, a, in a master plan. What are the ideas behind this project? Well, of course, uh, over, an overall closely knit mix of uses, a priority, priority to small scale businesses and employment initiatives a considerable amount of social housing and diverse co-housing and a variety of cultural and social infrastructure and of course walkable streets with hopefully only a few cars. This area is much smaller. It has 64 sites in total. It has six 1,500 inhabitants today and 2,000 jobs. There's a new infrastructure related to the people living there, fundamental school, two or three child cares, playgrounds and community centers. And well, I forgot to tell uh, uh, when I uh, presented the project in Hamburg, the developer of this project is the Hamburg Hafen GmbH, uh, it's a private developer which is owned by the city themselves. And they, uh, they uh, as a private developer, they can act like a pri private developer, but they have to fulfill the overall targets that have been given by the uh, munis municipality, by the local parliament. That's the construction behind that. And by selling the ground, they pay the, by selling the ground to uh, private investors, they finance the infrastructure. Um, the developer in this project in Tübingen is the Department of Urban Renewal of the city of Tübingen. It's not a private, but the public, not a private developer, but the public municipality. And the planner was a young architectural studio from Stuttgart. That's what the area, the one of the areas looked like in, uh, well, 20 years ago. It's a historic picture. And now it looks like that. It was completely packed with little blocks and it's a very, very dense structure. This is the, the second uh, barrack, the Loretto barrack. Here, a um, very old historic picture. Then it was filled like that. And now it looks like that. A very packed, very small blocks. And very important is this green public space that st is structuring this area. I've, this is a very interesting project, project that got a lots of uh, rewards for, um, for good urban planning on a German and on a European level. I will not go into detail, but will stress two, two characteristics of this project, which seem 
to me very important when it comes to reduce reduce the impacts of reurbanization. First, using the existing building stock, and second, creating small scale urban mixed use by addressing and creating new clients. I will explain that. First of all, using the building housing stock. That's what they did uh, in the first place in, in, in Tübingen. They converted the old barracks, French barracks, into students' apartments. Tübingen being a student's town, every fourth citizen of Tübingen is a student. 75,000 inhabitants, 25,000 students. And they always need room to live, and this was a perfect place for them, as it was close to the university. And there was this situation that from the very start of the converting this area, there were young, educated, active people living there. And they also put a childcare center for the students in this area, in, in this building, sorry. And they converted the old stables. They, it was a very old barrack, so they dated back to times where they had horses. Um, they converted the stables to, uh, to workshops and to studios and to shops for young startups enterprises who organized and uh, refurbished the building by self-help. And then they converted the old tank hall into the, well, uh, into a roofed playground where there is also the market in, in winter and where the people have their parties and so on. This is one prominent feature of this project. The other one is, and maybe a little bit more important, is that they invented a new, well, in sort of investor. The German word for it is Bauherrngemeinschaften. This is very not so easy to translate. How you help me? It's, I call it association of clients. So it's a, a group of private people who form. Association of building owners. Association of building owners, but they only come together for, uh, they are encouraged to form a group and plan as a group their building. Um, in Tübingen, this was the way where how they they managed to have small enterprises in the in the building. They were interested in having a small scale, closely knit urban mix of uses in this area, and they have uh, <coughs> they thought well. You can buy a. Hopla. You can buy a lot, little lot, parcel lot like that, but you have to bring a small enterprise that fills the first floor as a shop or as a studio and so on. And this worked out fine to the, to the surprise of many people. The city sold the parcel lots to this. Bauherrengemeinschaften, and they supported this Bauherrengemeinschaften and, the, and uh, give, give, give them advices for financing, for organizing, for have, have a plan that everybody can agree on. And the result of it is that each building in such a block looks different. Mm -hmm. And so it's a kind of planned variety in a dense urban tissue. Here, yeah, that's the way it looks. So small buildings, three or four, sometimes five stories, and each building is different. Not every bu building is a beautiful building. They have 
different tastes, different materials, different styles, but this is accepted. And they have, mostly have, uh, um, uh, uh, small enterprises, um, enterprise at least in the first floor, sometimes also in the second floor, let's say uh, a doctor or an architect or whatever. Yes, uh, the concept of Bauherrngemeinschaften was very, very successful. It was invented in this city, but it was, I could say, exported, brought into the other cities. The other cities copied that in Berlin, in Hamburg, even in the uh, Hafen city in Munich. And why was it so successful? The, the important, most important reason was that in doing working like that, instead of a professional investor, you could reduce the costs of housing by 15%. And this, was, this made it possible for, for many young families to find a place to live and to uh, have their own housing in the very center of the city. So this Bauherrngemeinschaften is a, well, is, it's, it's can call it a social innovation that was brought up in Tübingen and was had a, a successful career all over the country. That's a, a street, one of the streets in in Tübingen. And if you have a chance to come to Germany and you're looking for interesting projects, I would recommend go to Tübingen and go to the Hafen city. Um, well, that's my last, uh, my last picture. I t told you, uh, try to give you an idea of inner city projects in Germany. They are all, the background of these projects is a process of reurbanization of the uh, new attractivity of the inner city areas. There are two different kinds of areas, old inner city areas that are in transition, that are changes by lots of little inve housing investments and investments of public investments into the infrastructure and that, that lead to changes in those traditional housing areas and we have those big new urban projects. We have this both in Stuttgart both and in Portland, and it will be one of our uh, important uh, tasks of our research study to identify these areas, to identify the social impacts of these processes and the architectural forms that they generate. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think our students are waiting. I hope you can uh, stay a little longer because our students would like to have a little panel discussions and I discussed and I'm not sure where they are. They are, they are. Eli, where are you? Oh there. Okay. Eli and his group will take over here. And uh, I'm not sure what well, you are doing. Hello. Okay, as part of the panel discussion, we'd like to introduce Susan Ingham. Born and raised in Seattle, Washington, Susan uh, spent a short time in Japan as an exchange student and then continued her studies at the University of California at Berkeley. 
Uh, while at Berkeley, Stu Susan studied and worked intensively with noted professor architect and author Christopher Alexander. Prior to founding Casa Architecture, student work, uh, I'm sorry, Susan worked in architectural offices in San Francisco, Boston, Philadelphia, Berkeley, and Seattle. In 2004, she founded Casa Architecture and also participated as a founding member of the Building Process Alliance. So please welcome Susan for this panel. So if, if you'd like to take a seat. Oh, yeah, well, uh, Haya, we'd like, also like to introduce our professor, Haya, if you, if you care to join the panel. I'd like to join. I think, I think it'd be nice. Just so, because I, I think the, uh, so the, the topic, just for the sake of time, I think we're going to limit it. We had a few different topics prepared uh, tonight, but I think we're going to try and limit it to one topic, uh, just for the sake of maybe a richer conversation. And I'll let, I'll let Nigel introduce it, but especially given the last, the last uh, project that you brought up with the Bauher Gemeinschaften uh, and, and kind of the, the different economics of that sort of neighborhood and, and the neighborhood that we're in, in the Old Town, Chinatown, and, and the Pearl District, um, I think Nigel has a, a pretty compelling question that we can kind of talk about as a panel. <coughs> Good evening. Thank you, Johan, for coming out and uh, speaking with us. Uh, so I, I wanted to talk about uh, significant um, social change that's happening um, right now. <clears throat> so the economic downturn um, affected Portland in a similar manner that uh, Europe was affected, where a lot of Eastern European countries uh, lost a lot of money and a lot of people were homeless and forced to migrate to other, other places. In, in Europe, and Germany being one of those places. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, um, as the population grows and homeless population grows as well, um, Portland has become socially accepting in this culture and this condition. Is there a similar condition arising in Stuttgart, and how has the city approached this phenomenon in a significant way? And, and for, the, uh, for the structure of, for yeah. before you go, this, for the structure, we just like a response from each of you. Yeah regarding that question. Yeah. Well, you know, Stuttgart is not a place where there are many homeless people, I would say. Can I bring the mic closer? Sorry, yes. Stuttgart is not a, uh, as I told you, Yes. Well, as I told, uh, Stuttgart is one of those more prosperous regions in Germany, and right now there are not so many homeless people in, in Stuttgart. Of course there are homeless people, and the, um, there are some arrangements for them. Some, it's, I don't know the English, specific English words for that, but there are places where they can, there are shelters where they can go, yeah, sheltering, homeless shelters, and um, sometimes you see them in the inner city public spaces, but it's, uh, it's, not, um, it's not very, um, hmm. there, there are not so many uh, homeless people in Stuttgart because the labor market in Stuttgart is pretty well, so those who uh, are looking for a job find a job, even bad jobs, but they have a job. And, uh, but the more severe problem is that the rents are very high. So it's, it's not the homeless people is not the most important social problem in, in Stuttgart. The more, most important problem right now, I would say, is uh, the lack of affordable housing. So people, most of the people have a home, but they have to pay a lot of for it, even if it's a, not a rundown home. So, Hayo, would you care to respond to this similar question? 
Dann nimm das. Ja, so. Ja, I'm usually telling my students there are certain ways you can solve with architectural uh, intervention and others you have to do to solve by other means. And uh, one of them is uh, uh, homelessness. In uh, Europe, especially in Germany and other Central European countries, there are laws that actually take care of homeless. And that is how you take care of it. Uh, by supporting them in a way that they actually could live, even if you have uh, people who are homeless around, they are doing it more because they have sort of they like it. There are some some some. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of lifestyle, but there are very few. There are not so many. And um, in this country, we try to solve it through architectural means because we don't have this uh, means uh, that the state. Uh, takes tax money and actually provides for the for the homeless. So it's a totally different concept of how to go about trying to solve that problem, and uh, that's the reason also why, why the question to you on he would say, well, I don't really see it too much there. There's not there don't really exist in some. I mean that's in essence what he was uh, saying, um, but I'm not sure what Susan thinks about it. Yeah. And Susan, if you could address maybe the San Francisco and the Tenderloin specifically. Yeah. Well, uh, is this on? Does that work? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I live in Seattle now, and um, we don't have, uh, I think we're similar to what you guys have here. Uh, I was just recently in the Bay Area, though, in San Francisco, staying, actually my hotel was technically in the Tenderloin. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I was, uh, amazed at how much more homelessness there is there now than there was when I was living there officially. Um, it's, uh, and, and from what I understand, at least from San Francisco, is, is it's, uh, it's, it's become this very intractable problem. And every mayor, mayoral race uh, has to deal with it. Uh, but there are probably others that are more familiar with the Bay Area than I am right now. Uh, I know in Seattle, anyway, there's a certain street uh, in downtown Seattle uh, where um, there's kind of a, a locus of crime activity and homelessness, and um, uh, it's, it's basically about three or four blocks. Um, but it's, of course, right next to a main shopping area and incorporates some of the outdoor space there. Uh, and so we're having a mayoral race coming up this November, and um, it's it's definitely a, a main topic, I think, of, of what to do there. And uh, it's it's a much smaller scale, I would say, than the Bay Area. Part of it may have to do with climate, but um, it's becoming a, a larger problem, I think. And and to me, that's kind of one of the main issues of of American cities is the homeless problem. And I agree with Hayo. There's things that we can do, but uh, I think it's a pretty big social issue for our country. So back to Johan. Uh, in, in Stuttgart, are there, are there any architectural examples that you can think of that would be relevant to American cities as, as potential solutions for homelessness that are outside of this, of this uh, policy-driven difference? I d das war, was ist? Ja, well, uh, I'm afraid I, there are no examples for that because the, there are, it's different to, to San Francisco and Seattle. Homelessness is not an issue that is discussed about and nobody is, there are no students' projects on how to help the homeless people with new shelters, which is always a sign that it's not so very uh, uh, important problem right now because students are the first that realize where, uh, where there are problems and uh, they want to find solutions. But I can't remember of any student's project that uh, uh, relates to the matter of homelessness. So this might be a difference, yes. But there are lots of projects to how to create uh, affordable housing, of course. Well, I think, I think that's a good segue. Maybe we'll go into the next question yeah. uh, involving education. So um, I think this is kind of a, a 
double-ended question. That there's a there's a distinct difference between the German architectural educational system and the American educational system, uh, especially in terms of technical rigor. Let's say, uh, and and we have these these two kind of iconic images on this screen behind you. Um, one is of the Germany's environmental uh, agency by Sabra Hutton and on the on the bottom, and then uh, in Portland here we have the federal building that was just recently finished. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's James Cutler uh, building, and kind of how these buildings relate to their perspective uh, laws, or you know, the United States relating to lead and uh, the German buildings relating to this. I'm gonna try and not butcher this. And <laughs> Energie Einspar wird Verordnung. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, in, in terms of how our generation of students in both, in both prospective countries are going to learn about how to create buildings, um, what are these major differences and how can we feed off of each other? Well, I don't know not so very much. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> so very much about the education of architects in America. Uh, and there's no, the education of architects in Germany has several routes. Yeah, I told you, there the main route is the schools where uh, Hayo and I have studied. These are the technical universities, which have a, have a very strong engineering background to it. And then we have uh, art academies, they also educate architects, where this engineer perspective is not that strong, more the artistic approach. And, um, well, these, this, is a, this is an important difference. And, uh, well, when it comes to green building and energy saving building, these are uh, topics and subjects of education that have been have become in those technical universities, have, there they have become very important issues. And not only in education, but also in the research at uh, Faculty of Architecture, I would say, yes. And Susan, could you comment on the American University educational system for architecture, just briefly, and how it relates to, to these invite to lead? Uh, sure, I can. I can um I can do that. Uh, I mean, as most of us know, it's um, uh, there are a couple paths in our country as well. One is, I think, still the five-year professional degree that one can get right out of high school. Uh, but I think what's at least the last maybe 20 years or so, uh, there's been a shift away from that. I think those programs still exist, but it's more the four and two model where uh, you have a four-year undergraduate degree in architecture, and then you go on to get your professional degree in a master's program, which is a two-year program. Uh, so the difference that I see is, is uh, the, the, two, the four and two is, is uh, I would say, I wouldn't say less rigorous, but less maybe focused or... Um, I think the German model is more on the five year, uh, more equivalent perhaps to our five year professional degree programs where they're very focused on studying architecture in Germany uh, and not so much on the liberal arts education that we, that we have in, in a lot of uh, schools here. So uh, to me, our, our, our system is more broad at the beginning uh, and then gets more focused in the two-year master's program versus being more focused throughout. And, well, and Hayo, could you just comment, because I, I think you have both perspectives, perhaps. Yes, uh, just confirming that Johan and I went to a technical university where the first two years are rigorously technical, mathematical, geometrical, <laughs> plumbing and heating, Remember all of this? Uh, I mean, it's really, and you have to have a diploma for that. If you don't succeed after two years in that diploma, you cannot continue. And only then do you get into 
architectural creative work. Yes, a little bit of this uh, before, but really studio and design comes after two years after you have mastered these technical issues. Uh, and uh, uh, of course that makes a huge difference because then what Johan is saying, you can deal with all kinds of technical issues and a green building of course is, is, a, is, is a big outcome of that. Uh, for example, the University of uh, uh, Technical University of Darmstadt, they win every year the, the competition in Washington that deals uh, with, I don't know the name for it, but it uh, deals with, uh, with green building, you know. Yeah. But there's a, there's a name for it. Yeah, exactly. um, so that tells you uh, uh, something about it. But there's a recent development that uh, I also need to mention, and that is the European overall educational system started to uh, uh, create a kind of uh, undergraduate, bachelor, and master. But the bachelor only has three years. And in three years, Nobody can learn architecture. I have no idea how they do this, and that's why uh, the, the many universities right now, I know my, my colleague uh, Ralph in Dresden, Ralph Weber, he, he told me recently that they are uh, scaling back to the old system because they don't know what to do with this new system. Uh, so that's a recent development that sort of confuses the picture a little bit. But still, the, 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 the technical solidity, that's, that's pretty much, I think that's a given in, in German uh, uh, technical university education. I have one more point. One other difference, and Hayo can correct me, but my understanding is that when you graduate from a technical university with architecture in Germany and other European countries, you are a licensed architect. No. Oh, you're not? No, okay. no, no you're not. No. But you don't, ha you don't have this internship period that we have. We, uh, have, we, have, we have. Oh, you do? Yes. All right. Yes. We have. Well, you can answer that. Yeah, well, first of all, I, I should, well, you have to do a two years internship okay. as an architect and then you can call yourself an architect and can become a member of the architectural chamber. Is there a thing like that? Yes, yeah, same yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Well, Chamber, then, so it takes two years. It's not only the architects but also the urban planner. You only can call you yourself an urban planner when you have a two years internship. Uh, no, okay. but you have to show that you've done specific works. And I, have, th yeah. I think that's what Susan is referring to, because our examination, because it's so rigorous in its technical disciplines, takes place at the end of your studies. And when you have uh, 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 succeeded in all these disciplines, then you don't have to take any other examination, but you still have to do the two-year internship. And that's only because the education is supposedly so good that that is equivalent to an exam examination that you would have to take here for getting your license. I think that's what yeah. you were referring that's to. Yeah. I think for the, the final few moments that we have uh, before we end this discussion, if there's anybody in the audience that has any questions or, or any comments regarding the situation, we'd like to hear from anybody. There are strategies. Um, not every municipality follows those strategies, but there are strategies. And they, one of the strategies are so-called um, quota regulations. So in a very popular the strategy is in the city of Munich. They say Munich is a prospering region, and they there are so many investors who want to invest into housing and they only get the right to build on certain areas when they guarantee that they build 30% of affordable housing. So that, this is a, the quota they have to fulfill. In other areas like Stuttgart, which is not that prosperous, this quota is 20%. So, but it's 
the only city where it really works out well, I know, is, Stutt uh, is Munich. In Stuttgart, they have problems to implement that because there are so many, th this is politically not, there's no, not a, there is dispute on that. So, so there are conservatives who say, well, this is uh, not market conform, so we shouldn't do things like that. But there are cities who try to, 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 to have these regulations. And I know this is pretty similar to what they've done here in, in the Pearl District too, isn't it? I see. The I saw. Uh. Are there any last comments? Would you like the microphone? Uh, yes. Um, I'd like to, if, if you could try to tie in the uh, high level introductory lecture. If you, if you could somehow, somehow. on system A and system B and um, and your lecture on urban regeneration. Um, and I would also love it if Hayo and Susan commented on the quality of spaces produced. And, and uh, it's because it seems um, to me that uh, uh, there is, uh, at the design level, we seem to be able to uh, redesign cities in, uh, in a more coherent fashion by going back to principles of uh, pre-modern urbanism. Uh, but uh, but, I'm, uh, but the issues of the size of investment, uh, the, the size of the, uh, of the piece of land, uh, I think there were, it seems to me that you were beginning to talk about that, but, but I, I would be very happy if you address it more uh, directly. Mm -hmm. The financial mechanisms behind, behind the investment and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, there are, I thought about it myself when I heard the presentation of Hayo and what does my presentation add to it or how are the links between both presentations. And um, I think the closest relation is between what I uh, introduced in the project of Tübingen, where they address the private household directly and giving them the power and the right to create their own city as a dense city, not as a single suburban family house, but in a very dense structure, and it's a kind, kind of quadration of the circle they tr tried to reach there in, the, in, in Tübingen. Having um, uh, uh, a very dense mixed urban structure on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, small enterprises groups of private households who are the clients of this new neighborhood. And I think they were pretty successful in doing so. This is not the normal way in, in uh, urban regeneration in Germany. The normal way is that you, the city, that a de developer buys a piece of land and then he builds his houses or his office building and then People asked to rent it or to buy it, whatever. So th this is a, I think this is a uh, kind of production of urban places that might come close to what Hayo, Hayo uh, pointed out. Hayo, could you also comment? I can hardly raise a question, but uh, should I first? 
Yes, I was uh, actually thinking uh, about uh, a project that I haven't talked about, uh, and that is the, uh, it's, it's published in the book, uh, A New Theory of Urban Design, which I thought is very, very similar in terms of what uh, was, ha I, I don't understand the, the project yet in tubing, but that was very close in terms of very essential uh, features like, as you said, in a trying to create a dense urban situation but giving the individual owners in small-scale steps and in ownership and financial uh, uh, processes, a very large hand to create their own history and their own uh, neighborhood in a way that uh, is more organic, if I want to use that word. And so I saw very, very close, uh, very, very uh, strong connections there in, in uh, attempts that we make in this uh, very, very interesting uh, example in tubing. And Susan, could you also comment? Yeah. It's a uh, good question, Yodan, because uh, I also was thinking of that uh, similar thing uh, as as Johan was was presenting, and for me, uh, the other connections that I made were a couple of the ideas that you put forth, Johan. One was this idea of the rough mix. Uh, somehow, you know, it it brings to mind um, kind of world system B is a, is sort of the the basic structure, and then this rough mix of people kind of inserting buildings or different uses and mixes into that. And I love the example that you gave of the luxury uh, apartments or houses next to the power plant. Uh, you know, that conjured in my mind this, this uh, idea of world system A and B and, and what you alluded to, Hayo, this uh, kind of taking the best of both or, or working with each other. Uh, so I thought of that. And then the other example was um, this great idea of converting office buildings to residences, uh, which I'd never even thought about, uh, but then showing this very world system B, you know, 1950s or 60s office building, and then showing how that could actually be transformed in a similar idea by just, you know, building a new skin and making it uh, more of a beautiful thing. And... Uh, <laughs> That certainly uh, would be great if that would happen more in our country, I think. Uh, but that, again, was this idea of taking something banal and uh, trying to make it alive. Uh, and I think that's, that was what Haya was alluding to as well. I think we have time just for one more comment. Howard, did you have a well, comment? My, my question about tubing is whether there's a mechanism that would, um, that would guarantee that rising property values wouldn't drive out all of those small businesses and families? Or am I, des or am I describing a particularly American phenomenon? Yes. Um, um, well, the project in tubing is now, it's completed now. And it's, they started to move in I would say 15 years ago, so it's a slow process. And um, as far as I know, there's not this uh, process of displacement of those small enterprises. And one, there's a lot of changes because the small enterprises sometimes don't work and they go bankrupt. Or, well, Sometimes they have a restaurant and that doesn't work. There's a lot of change. But it's not because of the rising um, uh, rents or the rising prices. And I think one of the reasons is that, they, that it is not owned by one single owner, but by, let's say, eight or nine owners. And there are regulations that, that, that there is a kind of control, price control. I would say so, yes. Uh, but there's, of course, there are limits to it, uh, legal limits to it. So it's more an uh, arrangement that they have uh, defined by a contract. But uh, and um, as far as I know, this has not happened yet. Are there any last comments from the panel? Good. We can end it there. Uh, thank you for the panel and everybody for your discussion. We have, have a round of applause.
I would like to thank our student uh, group, very uh, well organized student group, who really did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you to Johan. Thank you. Thank you.